Welcome to my channel The Classic Audio Books. This channel is for spreading interest of all listeners to books that helps you to know about the books and writer as well. We always request you if you like the audio book after listening, you must have to buy that book and read for respect to writer and their hard work. After listening this part please like the video if you like and share to your friends and don't forget to get subscribe click on bell button for future notification. And now don't skip keep listening. The classic audio books presented when did the mahabharat war happen the mystery of arundhati part 3 written by nilesh nilkantok we all know about the mahabharat war between kuru and pandava here writer has been proved the time and date in this book here i got the platform to read the book i also curious about the book so let's start when did the mahabharat war happen The mystery of Arundhati Nilesh Nilkanth Oak Part 3 Lunar Eclipse Lunar eclipses do not occur every month because of the inclination of the moon's orbit. They do happen at least twice a year and one is far more likely to be able to observe lunar eclipse than a solar one. The reason is that when the moon gets dark it is because it does not receive the sunlight and it then is dark for anyone who can see it. So instead of having to be in a rather narrow path As happens for solar eclipses, you only have to be in a part of the world from which the moon is visible at the time of the eclipse. Pretty much half the world qualifies as with solar eclipses, there are partial and total lunar eclipses. If the moon does not enter into the umbra, the darkest part of the earth's shadow, then it does not darken completely and we get a partial eclipse. These are hard to notice. The moon just darkens a bit but does not disappear completely into the night. The shadow of the earth can be divided into two distinctive parts, the umbra and penumbra. Within the umbra, there is no direct solar radiation. However, as a result of the sun's large angular size, solar illumination is only partially blocked in the outer portion of the earth's shadow, which is given the name penumbra. A penumbral eclipse occurs when the moon passes through the earth's penumbra. The penumbra causes a subtle darkening of the moon's surface. A special type of penumbral eclipse is a total penumbral eclipse during which the moon lies exclusively within the earth's penumbra. Total penumbral eclipses are rare and when these occur that portion of the moon which is closest to the umbra can appear somewhat darker than the rest of the moon. A partial lunar eclipse occurs when only a portion of the moon enters the umbra. When the moon travels completely into the earth's umbra, one observes a total lunar eclipse. The moon's speed through the shadow is about 1 km per second and totality may last up to nearly 107 minutes. Nevertheless, the total time between the moon's first and last contact with the shadow is much longer and could last up to 3.8 hours. The relative distance of the moon from the earth at the time of an eclipse can affect the eclipse's duration. In particular, when the moon is near its apogee, the farthest point from the earth in its orbit, its orbital speed is the slowest. The diameter of the umbra does not decrease much with distance. Thus, a totally eclipsed moon occurring near apogee will lengthen the duration of totality. A selenalian or selenihelion occurs when both the sun and the eclipsed moon can be observed at the same time. This can only happen just before sunset or just after sunrise and both bodies will appear just above the horizon at nearly opposite points in the sky. This arrangement has led to the phenomenon being referred to as a horizontal eclipse. It happens during every lunar eclipse at all those places on the earth where it is sunrise or sunset at the time. Indeed, the red and light that reaches the moon comes from all the simultaneous sunrises and sunsets on the earth. Although the moon is in the earth's geometrical shadow, the sun and the eclipsed moon can appear in the sky at the same time because the refraction of light through the earth's atmosphere causes objects near the horizon to appear higher in the sky than their true geometric position. The moon does not completely disappear as it passes through the umbra because of the refraction of sunlight by the earth's atmosphere into the shadow cone. If the earth had no atmosphere, the moon would be completely dark during an eclipse. The red coloring arises because sunlight reaching the moon must pass through a long and dense layer of the earth's atmosphere where it is scattered. Shorter wavelengths are more likely to be scattered by the small particles and so by the time the light has passed through the atmosphere the longer wavelengths dominate. This resulting light we perceive as red 
This is the same effect that causes sunsets and sunrises to turn the sky a reddish color. An alternative way of considering the problem is to realize that, as viewed from the moon, the sun would appear to be setting, or rising, behind the earth. The amount of refracted light depends on the amount of dust or clouds in the atmosphere. This also controls how much light is scattered. In general, the dustier the atmosphere, the more that other wavelengths of light will be removed, compared to red light, leaving the resulting light a deeper red color. This causes the resulting coppery red hue of the moon to vary from one eclipse to the next. Volcanoes are notable for expelling large quantities of dust into the atmosphere. And a large eruption shortly before an eclipse can have a large effect on the resulting color. Bore activities are notable for expelling large quantities of dust into the atmosphere. Julian and Gregorian calendars The Julian calendar, a reform of Roman calendar, was introduced by Julius Caesar in 46 BC, and came into force in 45 BC. It was designed to approximate the tropical year. It has a regular year of 365 days divided into 12 months, and a leap day added to February, every four years which makes average Julian year 365.25 days long. The Julian calendar overestimates the length of the year by 0.0078 days and this discrepancy results in shifting of equinox or solstice days over a long period of time. The Gregorian calendar was introduced in 1582 AD. The Gregorian calendar modified the Julian calendar's regular cycle of leap years, years exactly divisible by 4, by introducing a caveat every year that is exactly divisible by 4 as a leap year, except for year that are exactly divisible by 100. The centurial years that are exactly divisible by 400 are still leap years, thus the year 1900 is not a leap year, but the year 2000 is a leap year. This modification changed the mean length of the calendar year from 365.25 days to 365.2425 days. The Gregorian calendar also dealt with the past accumulated difference between these lengths. Roman Catholic Church thought that the First Council of Nicaea had fixed the vernal equinox on the 21st of March and by the time of Gregory's edict for modification of calendar in 1582, the vernal equinox had moved backwards in the calendar and was occurring on about the 11th of March 10 days earlier. The Gregory calendar therefore began by dropping 10 calendar days, the 5th to the 14th of October in 1582a. D. To revert to the previous date of the vernal equinox, the marginal difference of 0.000125 days between the Gregorian calendar average year and the actual year means that, in around 8000 years, the calendar will be about one day behind where it is now. It is important to remember that the Earth's rotation also experiences some variation and thus the change in the length of the vernal equinox year cannot be accurately predicted. Historical research uses the Gregorian calendar for the events after 16 century and uses the Julian calendar for the events before 16 inches century. Mahabharat astronomy while the West was still thinking, perhaps, of 6000 years old universe India was already envisioning ages and eons and galaxies as numerous as the sands of the Ganges. The universe so vast that modern astronomy slips into its folds without a ripple. Houston Smith when you gaze at the sky, you might appreciate a single star twinkling more than others around it, a collection of stars forming a well-known constellation, an apparent planet, or a streaking flash of light. Your efforts to observe the vast universe that surrounds you and make sense of what you see, whether novice or advanced, is your participation in the field of astronomy. Since ancient times, people have relied on the sky to serve as a guiding light helping them navigate across land or water or measure the passage of time. The celestial events they observed in the sky further served as a backdrop against which to explain their own fate and fortune both past and present. The Mahabharat text describes well-established nakshatra system, lunar and solar years including methods for periodic corrections to synchronize these two systems. Mahabharat calendar I am using the term Mahabharat calendar in a broader context. Context I have in mind includes Indian notions of day, month, year, seasons, epochs as well as techniques used to measure them and rules laid down to make necessary corrections. 
this development continues to this day. However, my goal is to restrict myself in describing the calendar system prevalent during the days of Mahabharat. This is a challenging task. My approach is to address the challenge by relying on evidence internal to Mahabharat. Samvatsara or Varsha year Mahabharat definition of a year is decidedly lunisolar. Varsha, Satra and Samvatsara are interchangeably employed to mean year in the Mahabharat text. I conjecture that the Vedic practice of performing Yajna or Satra with clear aim of keeping track of time and to make necessary corrections was well established by the time of Mahabharat. The Mahabharat text does refer to the Pandavas performing Satra during their time in the forest and it may be driven by their objective, if not the sole objective, to keep track of their time in the forest. Usage of Varsha for a year also suggests the beginning of a year with the rainy season, and in the Indian context that meant on summer solstice. At least one of the many beginnings of a year can be said to begin with summer solstice during Mahabharat time, unless of course the term continued its use from Vedic times when Varsha, rain, and summer solstice were used as beginning of a new year and thus coincided with beginning and end of Satra or Yajna or Samvatsara. Mahabharata is thus not explicit regarding the beginning of a new year. Mahabharata is clear about daily calendar being lunar in origin and also about the fact that approximately two additional months were added every five years in order to synchronize lunar calendar with the solar calendar. Mahabharata calendar employed lunar months in daily practice and this is apparent throughout the text. On the other hand, Mahabharat society was aware of both lunar and solar years, and choice of lunar vs solar year was responsible for Dairodhana's confusion regarding the total duration spent by the Pandavas in exile. Luni solar year and yuga The word yuga has multiple meanings however I want to emphasize one of the many contexts in which it is used in the Mahabharat. Yuga I am referring to is the yuga of five years. Incorporation of additional two lunar months every five lunar years brought lunar calendar in accord with the solar calendar. Bhishma refers to insertion of two Adhika Masa extra months during each five-year period. Seasons, Rutu, six seasons were recognized with each season made up of approximately two lunar months. The seasons, Rutu, were designated as Vasan, Spring, Grishma, Summer, Varsha, Rain, Sharad, Early Autumn, Himanta, Late Autumn, and Shishir, Winter. Lunar month The moon makes a complete orbit around the Earth every 27.3 days, sidereal period. However, since the Earth is moving in its orbit about the Sun at the same time, it takes slightly longer for the moon to show its same face to the Earth, which is about 29.5 days. The periodic variations in the geometry of the Earth-Moon-Sun system are responsible for the phases of the Moon, which repeat every 29.5 days, synodic period. This is a lunar month. Lunar month, Amanta or Purnamanta, lunar month, per Amanta reckoning, begins with new moon, Amavasya, day and end with next new moon day. There is no clear reference in Mahabharat. Referring to starting point of the lunar month, we have to infer the beginning of the lunar month from available evidence. Available evidence, per P. V. Kane, suggests two beginnings for the month, one starting with new moon day, Amanta, as is the case at present and another starting with full moon day, Purnamanta, Mahabharat calendar had 12 lunar months, including one extra month, which was inserted every two and a half years. The 12 months were Chaitra, Vashakha, Jastha, Ashadha, Shravana, Prashtapad, Bhadrapada, Ashwan, Kartika, Margashirsh, Posha, Maghar and Falguna. Proximity of Nakshatra to the full moon determined the lunar month and its designation. For example, if full moon appeared near Kritika, then the month was designated as Kartika and the full moon day was the midpoint of that month, per Amanta reckoning. Purnamanta system recognized full moon day, Purnima, as beginning and end of the lunar month with new moon day, Amavasya, as the center point of the month. I have assumed Amanta reckoning for lunar months throughout the book. Paksha, bright half and dark half of the lunar month. Paksha is defined as a period of approximately 13 to 16 days when the moon changes phases either from new moon, not visible, to full moon, fully visible, or vice versa. The Paksha that begins with new moon and ends with full moon is called Shukla Paksha, bright half, and the Paksha that begins with full moon and ends with new moon is called Vadya or Krishna Paksha, dark half. 
combination of these two pakshas constitutes one lunar month. Chandra Kala, phases of the moon, the moon appears to be a circular disk from any location on the earth. The moon is always half illuminated by the sun. Since the moon orbits the earth, we get to see more or less of this half illuminated portion of the moon. During each lunar orbit, we see the moon's appearance change from not visibly illuminated, Amavasya, through partially illuminated to fully illuminated, Purnima, then back through partially illuminated to not illuminated, again. New moon day is called Amavasya and full moon day is called Purnima in Indian calendar system. On new moon day, moon's unilluminated side is facing the earth and thus is not visible, except during a solar eclipse. On the full moon day, the moon's illuminated side is facing the earth, and the moon appears to be completely illuminated by direct sunlight. Although full moon occurs each month at a specific date and time, the moon's disk may appear to be full for several nights in a row. This is because the percentage of the moon's disk that appears illuminated changes very slowly around the time of the full moon, also around new moon, but the moon is not visible at all then, the moon may appear 100% illuminated only on the night closest to the time of exact full moon, but on the night before and night after will appear 97-99% to illuminated. Most people would not notice the difference. Even two days from full moon the moon's disk is 93-97% to illuminated. The phases of the moon are related to, actually, caused by, the relative positions of the moon and sun in the sky. For example, new moon occurs when the sun and the moon are quite close together in the sky. The full moon occurs when the sun and the moon are at nearly opposite positions in the sky, which is why the full moon rises about the time of sunset, and sets about the time of sunrise, most places on the earth. The relationship of the moon's face to its angular distance in the sky from the sun allows us to establish very exact definitions of when the primary phases occur, independent of how they appear. Tithi, day of the lunar month, there are a total of 15 tithis in each paksha. They are named as Pratipada, one degree day of the Paksha, Dvitiya, Tritiya, Chaturthi, Panchami, Shasti, Saptami, Ashtami, Navami, Dashang, Ekadashi, Dwadashi, Triodashi, Chaturdashi and 15 inches day of Purnima. The Krishna Paksha follows the same nomenclature for Tithis except that the last day is Amavasya. Chandra Kala, phases of the moon, were employed in counting days of the month. Nomenclature of Tithi along with the reference to Paksha, Shukla or Krishna, refers to specific phase of the moon. Mahabharat method of referring to the day is by referring to the nakshatra closest to the moon. One can determine the lunar month with reasonable accuracy by knowing the nakshatra of the day along with the Paksha in the phase of the moon. In Indian calendar system Aha may refer to period of time when the sun is above the horizon, Ratra may refer to the time when the sun is below the horizon and Ahoratra is referring to modern 24 hours day. It is important to note that words Aham or Ratra were also used to designate 24 hour day in Mahabharat times. Day was further divided into Mahotas, 30 Mahotar equals 1 day equals 24 hours, which were in turn further divided into smaller units. Nakshatra, wives of the moon, predictable rising of the sun provided the ancients a unit of time. However, in order to track the progress of time, one aspires to monitor the motion of a moving object with respect to non-moving, non-moving only in a relative sense since all astral bodies are in motion, object. Observations of the moon's position, moving, with respect to those of nakshatras, not moving, at night provided such an opportunity. Astronomers of Mahabharat time used the system of Nakshatra Ganana, developed by their predecessors, to keep track of time. Nakshatra, which is loosely translated as asterism could be either a specific star, e.g. Chitra, or group of stars, e.g. Kritika, along the ecliptic and is employed as reference in stating the positions of astral bodies, sun, moon, planets, comets, etc. It appears that the desired number of nakshatras were determined based on how long it took the moon to complete one orbital cycle. Since the moon completes one cycle through its orbit in 27.3 days, 27 nakshatras were selected. This nakshatra system was also used to track positions of other astral bodies. 
Since the moon visited each nakshatra once every month, poetically, it was perceived as moon visiting each of his 27 wives each day of the month, until the moon visited all of them, only to repeat the cycle during the next month. These wives of moon were given specific names, were assigned a devata deity, and are frequently referred to by the name of their assigned deity. The nakshatras along with their yoga tara, deity, right ascension and declination measurements are listed in table 3. Some nakshatras have synonyms and were recognized by those synonyms, in addition to being referred to by their presiding deity. For example, Bhadrapada is also called Prashthapada, Dhanishthar is called Shravishthar and Shatabhisaj is called Shatatarka. Some variations can also be seen while assigning presiding deity to a given nakshatra. These variations, fortunately, do not lead to any confusion. Existence of other evidence and cross-references within Indian literature, prior to and after Mahabharat, are sufficient to understand the nakshatra referred to. The nakshatra closest to the moon on a given day as nakshatra of the day in Indian calendar system. Determination of the nakshatra of any given day based on visual observation can lead to an error of plus or minus one day. Orbit of the Sun Orbit of the Sun around the Earth is the reference plane for all Mahabharat astronomical observations made after the sunset, dusk, during the night and before the sunrise, dawn, nakshatras were employed to track positions of the Sun, the planets and other astral bodies such as comets. Position of the Sun with specific nakshatra gained significance at the points of equinoxes and solstices. Critical point to remember is that the direct observation of the position of the sun near a specific nakshatra is impossible and is thus inferred from the position and identification of nakshatras before sunrise or after sunset and are also based on the positions and the phases of the moon. Nods of the moon The sun's orbit is the basic plane of reference and is referred to as the ecliptic of the earth. The moon's orbit is along this ecliptic and intersects the ecliptic twice. The points of intersection are called nodes and are designated as Rahu, ascending node, and Ketu, descending node. The word Ketu referring to node of the moon does not appear in the Mahabharata text. The word Ketu does appear multiple times, however it appears either as underscore referring to flag, banner, symbol or as referring to a comet, e.g. Dhuma Ketu, literally smoking flag or banner. The positions of these nodes along with the positions of the Sun and the Moon play critical role in occurrences or predictions of eclipses. The Mahabharat text refers to Rahu in the sense of Moon's node whether it refers to solar or lunar eclipse. It is important to think of Rahu as area of the sky as opposed to a specific point. Nodes of the planets All nodes are calculated mathematical points, points are designated using nakshatra close to the mathematically calculated point, where the ecliptic is crossed by the plane of planets, or the moon's, orbit. All nodes are rather lines instead of points and are thus to be interpreted as an area of the sky, rather than a precise point. Planetary node periods are much longer than the period of the moon's node. The periodicity of the moon's node, e.g. Rahu, is, 18 years which means the moon's node will appear near the same nakshatra after 18 years most planetary node periods are of the order of 24000 to 26000 years about the same time it takes for the precession of equinoxes to complete one cycle thus node of a planet is stationary for all practical purposes however it will change in the long run as all nodes are moving counterclockwise around the ecliptic through nakshatras all of the planets in our solar system are approximately in the same plane with respect to the background star field and thus all the planets are observed along the ecliptic. Retrograde and oblique motions of planets If observed from one night to the next, a planet appears to move from the west to the east against the background stars, most of the time, occasionally. However, a planet's motion will appear to reverse direction, and the planet will for a short time, move from the east to the west against the background nakshatras, in modern times, this reversal is known as retrograde motion. Mercury usually turns retrograde three times a year and is typically retrograde for 24 days. Venus turns retrograde every 18 months and is typically retrograde for 42 days. Mars turns retrograde once in two years and remain retrograde for 80 days. 
Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto go retrograde once each year and for 120, 140, 150, 160 and 160 days respectively. All planets appear much brighter than their usual magnitude during their retrograde motion. A planet, otherwise seem to be moving parallel to the ecliptic, will cross the ecliptic at an angle, will go from north of the ecliptic to the south and vice versa. This oblique motion of a planet will usually, but not always, be around the node of that particular planet. While this oblique motion is well known to astronomers, I did not think much about it until circumstances led me to it. All planets have nodes and thus exhibit oblique motion around their respective nodes, however the observed effect is pronounced for Mars and Jupiter. In case of Mercury and Venus, the occurrence of oblique motion is too frequent and may not be visible, especially in case of the Mercury because of its proximity to the Sun, while in case of Saturn, it is too infrequent. Knowledge of the planets in Mahabharat times it appears that Mahabharat astronomers were aware of all the planets of solar system including Pluto, this may come as a shock and a surprise to the reader. Since Uranus, Neptune and Pluto were discovered, or rediscovered, in modern times by Herschel, 1781 AD, Veria, 1846 AD, and Tom, 1930 AD, respectively. Thus, instead of assuming that Mahabharat astronomers were aware of these planets, I decided to test my claim, previously made by P. V. Vartek, of Mahabharat astronomers being aware of these three planets, as part of my book. Mahabharat observations present us with at least five opportunities. These opportunities can be explained meaningfully only when we assume Mahabharat astronomers to have knowledge of all nine planets of the solar system. It is true that Uranus, Neptune and Pluto are referred only few times and only in indirect fashion, registered too. One set of specific Mahabharat observations makes sense, only if one assumes the knowledge of these three planets in Mahabharat times degree degree. Another set of specific Mahabharat observations leaves no doubt about the identification and positions of these three planets. What is also interesting is that the references to positions of Neptune and Pluto, planets smaller and farther than Uranus, can be inferred with stronger conviction than that of Uranus. On the other hand Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn are mentioned in the Mahabharat text numerous times and no doubt about their identification exists. The Mahabharat text refers to five planets by names that are consistent with rest of the ancient Indian literature. While Mercury is referred to as either Buddha or Son of the Moon, Somaputra or Shashijena, Venus is referred to as either Shukra or Brigasun, Son of Brigu, Mars is identified with multiple names such as Mangal, Angarakha, Purusha Graha, Evil Planet, Lohitangar and Son of the Earth, Dharaputra. Jupiter is predominantly identified with the name Brispati, Saturn is identified as Shani, Shanischa or Suryaputra, at times Mahabharat refers to planets simply by adjectives such as Shama, Dark, Dark Blue, Shweta, Registered, White, Light Blue, Tikshna, Sharp, or Tivra Plus, Intense, etc. One has to only guess, in such instances, a planet Mahabharat text might be referring to. Solstices and Equinoxes Ancient Indian literature contains references for a new year to begin with winter solstice, vernal equinox or summer solstice however Mahabharat is silent on the beginning of a new year. Solstices are designated in Indian calendar system as Uttarayan Bindu, winter solstice, and Dakshinayan Bindu, summer solstice, equinoxes are designated as Vasant Sampat, vernal equinox, and Sharad Sampat, fall equinox, precession of equinoxes affects beginning of new season with respect to Indian lunar calendar. Every 2000 years, the beginning of a season proceeds by one lunar month. Brightness of a celestial object, star or planet, the apparent magnitude, m, of a celestial body is a measure of its brightness as seen by an observer on the Earth, normalized to the value it would have in the absence of atmosphere. The brighter the object appears, the lower the value of its magnitude. The scale for apparent magnitude was initially calibrated by assigning zero value to the magnitude of Vega, Abhijit. 
Mahabharat descriptions of planets afflicting nakshatras The Mahabharat text describes planets afflicting, pidate, or attacking, akramya, specific nakshatras. Mahabharat researchers, proposing a theory and corresponding timing for the war, are required to interpret these Mahabharat observations. Observations can be interpreted in multiple ways. For example, the sun and the moon can be visualized as fighting against each other on the full moon day, at the time of sunset or sunrise. The same analogy might even be used on the day of Amavasya when both of them are next to each other. Distinguished stars, asterisms and constellations Specific stars, asterisms or constellations have received greater attention in the Mahabharata text, Beginning with the stars along the ecliptic belt, Rohini Aldabaan, appears to be one of the favorite stars of Mahabharat astronomers. Mahabharat text is at pain to describe various planets or positions of the moon in the context of Rohini, Chitra, Spica, Swati, Arcturus, Justha, Antares. Shravana, Altair, Kritika, Pleiades are some of the other key nakshatras besides Rohini, mentioned frequently in the Mahabharat text. Mahabharat text mentions Saptarshis, seven stars, that form the panhandle of the constellation Ursa Major and specifically Arundhati, Alcor, and Vashishtha, Mizar. The Mahabharat text refers to Abhijit, Viga, Dhanishtha, Sualasin, Rohini, Aldebaran, and Kritika, Pleiades, in a unique context and this very context is the subject of the next chapter. I an envious sister and fall of Abhijit sorry, know the start of the Julian day system 4700 BC is the earliest. This is a prehistoric date, the world's earliest civilizations date from around 3000 BC or so. The maker of sophisticated astronomy software in response to my query asking if software maker had plans to extend the usable timeline of their software to 25000 BC year. 1267 AD. Roger Bacon, an English friar, dispatched his faithful servant John, with a manuscript opus Maius addressed to Pope Clement IV with an urgent appeal to correct the calendar by nine days. Unfortunately Pope Clement IV died, probably before he had a chance to read opus Maius. The correction identified by Roger Bacon had to wait additional 300 plus years, when Pope Gregory XIII corrected the calendar in 1582 AD. Roll back the calendar by 16,000 years and roll the earth some 80 degrees in longitude east of Bacon's monastery to the fertile plains of, now extinct, River Saraswati. It is little wonder that story comes to us only in a mythologized form, but without missing either the urgency or the fervor of Bacon's appeal to Pope Clement IV. Here, 14,602 BC Lord Indra appeared worried and perplexed and conveyed his concern to Lord Skanda. Lord Indra requested Lord Skanda to discuss the matter with Lord Brahma and to come up with a solution. What was the problem that caused so much grief to Lord Indra? From mythological perspective, Indra is identified with the sun, in addition to many other designations, e.g. rain god, Skanda is identified with the axis of earth while Brahma is identified with the creator of cosmos. Problem Abhijit, Viga, younger sister of Rohini, Aldaban, desiring seniority over Rohini, went to the forest to perform austerities. Thus, Abhijit, Viga, slipped, moved from the sky. At that time, as a result, Indra approached Skanda and asked Skanda to discuss the matter with Brahma. Brahma ordained the beginning of time from Dhanishtha, Sualasin, while previous to this incident the beginning of time was from Rohini and the appropriate number of nakshatras existed, for time reckoning, being told like this by Indra, Kritika, Pleiades, the nakshatra with Agni as its deity and with the shape of a cart, or with seven heads, became happy and went up in the sky. My task is to make sense of the incidents described in this Mahabharat passage. Solutions proposed by others C.V. Vedya thinks of Abhijit as fictitious nakshatra added to the list of original 27, and states that the meaning of this Mahabharat observation is not quite clear to him. He interprets that when Dhanishtha was considered the first nakshatra, Kritika was pushed at the headship of nakshatras. His interpretation is contradictory since the first nakshatra in time reckoning is at the headship of nakshatras, 
In any case, he remains vague on implications of this observation and mentions this observation only to claim that Indians had some knowledge of astronomy during 3000 BC, the time interval he was trying to justify for the Mahabharat war. R. N. Iyengar attempts to interpret this observation, goes all over but really nowhere and fails miserably. He does not use this information anywhere either to make a case for his Mahabharat timeline or to employ it as a corroborative evidence for his timeline. I would hate to force my assertion on my readers and thus reproduce his explanation in the original. R. N. Iyengar writes. The above verse appears in all editions of Mahabharat, including the recognized Bori, Pune, critical edition where it appears in chapter 219. These four verses refer to the four stars Abhijit, Rohini, Dhanishtha and Kritika. The literal meaning of the first two verses is easy. However, what is meant by Abhijit and Rohini is not clear. In Vedic literature there is ambiguity as to whether the number of nakshatras was 27 or 28, in the much later Siddhantic astronomy whenever 28 stars are mentioned in dividing the ecliptic, Abhijit is placed between U Ashada and Shravana and is identified with star Vega, Alire, in Taitriya Sanhita, 4.4.10, only 27 stars are mentioned, whereas in Taitriya Brahmana, 1.5.1.3, 28 stars with Abhijit placed between U Ashada and Shravana are listed, again. Even though Rohini is popularly identified with Aldabaran, there is indication in the above text that Jastha was once called by the same name Rohini. Abhijit's competition with her elder sister Rohini and eventual vanishing from the sky should be an allegory for brightening followed by dimming beyond recognition. If we take the traditional position of Abhijit as the correct position since ancient times, its relative brightening would have been with respect to Antares, Jastha Rohini. There is an indirect allusion to the missing Abhijit in Taitriya Sanhita, Brahmana 3.3.6.4, also. In the available ancient Chinese, records on supernovae, there is reference to a star near Antares that vanished in 1400 BC. Could this be the vanishing star referred as Abhijit in Mahabharat? The statement that this happened when time, year, began with star Dhanishtha lends support to this possibility. Winter solstice at Dhanishtha was the period of Vedanga Jyotisha, which has been dated to 1400 BC. The meaning of the last three lines of the above verses, in relation to the previous ones is not clear as noted by S.B. Dikshit, a scholar of great repute. Notwithstanding the meaningless chatter of this passage, I want to highlight few precious nuggets quoted by R. N. Iyengar before I move on. Taitriya Sanhita mentions only 27 nakshatras while Taitriya Brahmana mentions 28 including Abhijit and also the fact that there is an indirect allusion to the missing Abhijit in Taitriya Sanhita Brahmana. These three observations provide corroborative support for my solution to the problem of fall of Abhijit. Since I have not established the solution as yet, I leave the subject as is for now. I may mention while passing that my solution to fall of Abhijit could be used to determine the timing of Taitriya Sanhita and Taitriya Brahmana. P. V. Holi refers to fall of Abhijit in one of his papers on dating of the Mahabharat war and claims that both Jastha, Antares, and Rohini, Aldebaran, were understood to be Rohini during Mahabharat times. He does not use this information anywhere in his paper. In effect Holi is saying what Iyengar said and both of them are at loss as to why even they mention this reference. P. V. Vertak interprets this observation in two different ways. I learnt of this observation from his book Swayambhu and I understood the implications of this observation because of him. My interpretation is different from his and I claim mine to be more consistent. I provide his translation with the aim of making clear the distinction between my interpretation and his. Vertex literal translation is from one of his papers, written some time after Swayambhu. Contesting Abhijit, Viga, the daughter-like younger sister of Rohini, Aldabaran, went to Vana, i.e. water, for heating the summer, Tapa, because she was desirous of seniority. I do not understand anything. I wish you good luck, but I must tell that the star Abhijit has slipped down from the sky. This is a distant time but you, Skanda, think of it with Brahma. At that time Brahma had reckoned the time, placing Dhanishtha at the top of the list of nakshatras. Rohini was also given first place in the past. I have gathered this much knowledge, Sankhya, when Indra talked like this. 
Kritika went to the heaven, i.e. attained the highest respectable position. That seven-headed constellation whose deity is fire, Agni, is still glittering. Vertek has provided additional explanation and I paraphrase it. The daughter-like younger sister of Rohini, Aldabaan, is Kritika, Pleiades, Kritika wanted seniority so she contested with Abhijit, Vigar. Vertek considers this as poetic idea to give an explanation to the fact that Abhijit slipped down and infers that writer of Mahabharat assumed Abhijit slipped down because of Kritika and thus were held responsible. He interprets that it was Kritika who went to Vana, meaning water or forest, for Tapa, meaning summer or penance, but it also means Kritika went to water for heating the summer. He wonders about his own interpretation of water and then suggests that Kritika went to rainy season, i.e. to summer solstice, when rainy season starts in India. Since Kritika were at summer solstice around 21,000 BC, he infers that slipping of Viga was observed around this time and hence the plausible correlation in Mahabharat writer's mind. To Vartek, Brahma's reckoning of Dhanishtha in the first place refers to the time when Dhanishtha was at the vernal equinox, which is around the same time as 21,000 BC and since Rohini was also in the first position in further antiquity, Vartek surmises that this was the time period of around 22,500 BC when Rohini was at summer solstice. Vertek thinks that by exposing these two ancient facts, Indra reveals to Skanda the two methods in vogue at that time, to list the nakshatras, one method that gave the first place to the nakshatra at vernal equinox, and the other that gave the first place to the nakshatra at summer solstice. Vertek suggests that this dialogue took place between Indra and Skanda around 13,000 BC. When there was a complete fall of Viga, and why would Indra tell this story to Skanda around 13,000 BC? Vertek asks the question and then answers that this was probably due to the fact that around 13,000 BC. Summer solstice was around Abhijit and some scholars might have suggested that Abhijit be given first place, however to oppose this proposal. Indra describes the past incident and brought to notice the fact that Abhijit had fallen to the horizon to become celestial north pole and so it was not useful as nakshatra for reckoning time. I consider myself lucky that Vertek retained his true discovery, i.e. Abhijit becoming pole star, in spite of the confusing explanation he entangled himself into. I provide straightforward and consistent interpretation of this observation. Where is Abhijit now? At present Abhijit has declination of plus 39 degrees, i.e. as far to the south as it gets from the celestial north pole. Another time Abhijit was so close to the ecliptic was in 25,000 BC Abhijit started moving away from the ecliptic, towards the north and became north pole star around 12,000 BC this is the phenomenon of the fall of Abhijit. After 12,000 BC Abhijit began moving away from the celestial north pole and towards the ecliptic to retain its present position. My interpretation all modern calendars require additional corrections, in addition to the protocol of periodic corrections. Assigning leap year every four years plus additional rule of not taking century year is a leap year unless it is evenly divisible by 400 or adding of extra lunar month, Adhika Masa, to every 2.5 lunar years are examples of periodic corrections. Slow movements caused by phenomena such as the precession of equinoxes make it necessary to apply major corrections in order to make sense of the calendar with the expectation of seasons, beginning of a new year and their connection with religious celebrations or rituals. It is not unusual for these sporadic but necessary corrections to get delayed until someone feels the urgency to fix the issue. He may be Roger Bacon who is worried about devout Christians celebrating their religious festivals on wrong days or he may be Indra who is worried about the mismatch between the beginning of the year and the first nakshatra. Nakshatras along the ecliptic are used in keeping track of time by noting down positions of the moon, each day, and positions of the sun during solstices and equinoxes. Allegorically speaking, functional nakshatra is a nakshatra that is useful in demarking the position of the moon, e.g. close to the ecliptic, and thus assist in keeping track of time and can be considered to be one having a social life. In this context, Abhijit moving towards the celestial north pole can be visualized as going to the forest, into seclusion and away from social life. 
As Abhijit approached the celestial pole, contemporary observers would have perceived Abhijit as being stationary, allegorically speaking, slipping, movement of Abhijit towards the celestial pole and its position close to the celestial pole can be visualized as going to the forest, away from social life, to do tapa, penance, by being stationary in one place. Abhijit began slipping towards the celestial pole after 25,000 BC and over time was becoming useless for the purposes of timekeeping. Since this slipping of Abhijit was an extremely slow process, the required correction of eliminating Abhijit as nakshatra and replacing her with another appropriate star or asterism was delayed, until the problem had to be faced head-on. When correction became imminent, Indian astronomers took the opportunity to make all necessary corrections, Indian astronomers made three specific corrections to their calendar. 1. Removed Abhijit from the list of nakshatras as Abhijit lost its utility in keeping track of time, i.e. Abhijit lost its status as functional nakshatra 2. Replaced Kritika in place of Abhijit as new nakshatra in order to have desired number 27 of nakshatras for time reckoning 3 replaced Rohini-based time reckoning with Dhanishtha-based time reckoning rationale for assigning Dhanishtha as the first nakshatra is same as that of why Rohini was considered the first nakshatra prior to this correction. Ancient Indian literature contains numerous references to a year, beginning with summer solstice, winter solstice or vernal equinox. If one wants to estimate the timing of this correction, one should look for the time when 1. Dhanishtha would be at one of the cardinal points, equinox or solstice. Considered plausible for the beginning of a year 2. Abhijit would be approaching the celestial north pole, with its position close enough to be considered north pole star or soon to attain such a status, i.e. in effect significantly away from the ecliptic and unable to act as functional nakshatra 3. Rohini should have been at this cardinal point prior to this event requirement of Abhijit approaching the celestial north pole is critical. The requirement is critical as the timing of crisis created by loss of Abhijit, as Nakshatra, was approaching and was getting worse with time and had to be squarely faced. On the other hand, Abhijit moving away from the celestial north pole would mean that the crisis should have been resolved long time ago. Error Elimination, Experiment 1 At present, Dhanishtha is located between the points of Winter Solstice and Vernal Equinox. 1. If we thumb the clock backward, we reach the point of Winter Solstice near Dhanishtha in 1600 BC. 2. Declination of Abhijit was around plus 40 degrees. 3. Abhijit was going away from the Celestial Pole. 4. Winter Solstice was near Rohini in 9500 BC If Winter Solstice is assumed to be the reference point when Nakshatra was given the first status, then progression of Winter Solstice from Rohini to Dhanishtha is consistent with Mahabharat observation. Winter Solstice is indeed a plausible point to begin a new year. On the other hand, the position of Abhijit was nowhere close to Celestial North Pole and is rather as far as it gets to the south, close to the ecliptic, and thus away from Celestial North Pole. In addition, Abhijit was moving away from Celestial North Pole. Abhijit moving away from the Celestial North Pole and the fact that its position was far away from the Celestial North Pole are decisive observations in support of rejecting this date as the timing of the fall of Abhijit. I want the reader to understand that it is possible to predict the timing of equinoxes or solstices near a specific nakshatra with accuracy. Error Elimination, Experiment 2, 1, The Autumnal Equinox was near Dhanishtha in 8500 BC. 2. Declination of Abhijit was around plus 68 degrees, significantly closer to the Celestial North Pole. 3. Abhijit was moving away from the Celestial North Pole. 4. Autumnal Equinox was near Rohini in 16,000 BC. The fact that Abhijit was moving away from the Celestial North Pole, 8500 BC, is decisive observation in support of rejecting this date as the timing of the fall of Abhijit. Error Elimination, Experiment 3, 1, Summer Solstice was near Dhanishtha in 14,500 BC. 2, Declination of Abhijit was around plus 74 degrees. 3, Position of Abhijit was the closest, among positions tested for four plausible time periods, to the Celestial North Pole and Abhijit was moving towards the Celestial North Pole. 
4. Summer solstice was near Rohini in 22,500 BC. Summer solstice is indeed a plausible time to begin a new year based on numerous references in ancient Indian literature including word for the year, Varsha, rain, that begins, in India, at the point of summer solstice. Abhijit had attained a position closer to the celestial north pole and was moving towards the point of celestial north pole. After additional 2500 years, 12048 BC, Abhijit was closest to the point of north celestial pole. This combination presents consistent scenario that would corroborate Mahabharat observation. I will return to outcome of this experiment after explaining one last scenario. Error Elimination, Experiment 4, 1, Vernal Equinox was near Dhanishtha in 20,000 BC. 2, Declination of Abhijit was around plus 46 degrees. 3, Abhijit was moving towards the Celestial North Pole but Abhijit's actual position was far away from the Celestial North Pole. 4, Vernal Equinox was near Rohini in 29,000 BC. While Vernal Equinox is a plausible point to begin a new year and while Abhijit is indeed moving towards the Celestial North Pole, the position of Abhijit, declination equals 46 degrees cannot justify the crisis described by fall of Abhijit. It will be useful to remember that declination attained by Abhijit when it is closest to the ecliptic, and thus farthest from the Celestial North Pole, is around plus 40 degrees critical discussion I noted down the direction of the movement as well as the position of Abhijit when specific solstice or equinox was near Dhanishtha, requirement of Rohini to be at the critical point of solstices or equinoxes, prior to Dhanishtha reaching the very same point, equinox or solstice, provided arrow of time. The Mahabharat text is not explicit when it comes to the beginning of a year. India has multiple time reckoning systems coexisting at present. New year, per western calendar, begins with 1 degree of January, while another new year, per Hindu calendar, begins with new moon day in the lunar month of Chaitra in some parts of India, while with new moon day of the lunar month of Vashakha in other parts, and still another year beginning with new moon day in the lunar month of Kartika. These are not the only systems of time reckonings in vogue, however my point being to illustrate more than one system of time reckonings coexisting at any given time. It could be the case during Mahabharat times, fortunately. Uncertainty surrounding the beginning of a year during Mahabharat times does not affect our ability to select the time for the fall of Abhijit from four plausible alternatives. Summer solstice near Dhanishtha around 14,500 BC corroborates all criteria for the fall of Abhijit. Abhijit began moving away from the ecliptic and towards the celestial north pole after 25,000 BC and astute astronomers would have noted the slipping away of Abhijit, away from the ecliptic, when the summer solstice was in Rohini 22,500 BC. For a star or asterism to become a nakshatra, its position should be at or close to the ecliptic, in order to be useful for time reckoning. Abhijit is not at or even close to the ecliptic and the only rational, I presume, ancient astronomers might have had for her inclusion into the nakshatra list as her conspicuous presence in the sky, partly due to her brightness, magnitude equals 0.07. Swati, Arcturus, or Shravana, Altair, might have been included in the nakshatra list for the same reasons as that of Abhijit. Swati is bright, magnitude equals 0.16, However her declination has changed from plus 20 degree, at present, to plus 60 degree around 7000 BC Shravana has magnitude of 1.02 and her declination has changed from plus 5 degrees, 200 BC, to plus 54 degrees around 13000 BC. It is important to note that the choice of Abhijit as a nakshatra is not an ideal choice. Even when Abhijit is closest to the ecliptic, its position is still far away from the ecliptic, plus 40 degrees, as Abhijit moved towards the celestial north pole. Astronomers would have faced difficulties in employing Abhijit as functional nakshatra, for tracking positions of the moon and or the sun, a necessary step in reckoning of time. With every passing century, or millennium, the difficulty would have turned into a problem that eventually turned into a crisis and thus had to be addressed. 
it was finally addressed around 14,500 BC, when Abhijit had slipped far away from the ecliptic and had attained declination of around 74 degrees Indian astronomers made three corrections. 1. They removed Abhijit from the list of nakshatras too added Kritika to the list of nakshatras making a total of functional nakshatras back to 27-3. They acknowledged the shift in the point of summer solstice, and hence the beginning of a year, which was now near Dhanishtha and assigned the first rank, among nakshatras, to Dhanishtha.